Welcome EFs everywhere to today's Williams at Work webinar. My name's Wendy Webster Coakley, class of 1985, and I oversee alumni career networking for the college. A few reminders before we get started. If you have questions at any time during today's talk, you can submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Marty and Camille want this to be a dynamic conversation with you, the audience, and we'll try to answer them in real time. So no need to wait till the end to submit those questions. The chat function is your space to engage with the community and share your reflections, including when Marty and Camille offer prompts for you to think about and maybe comment upon. Remember to select all panelists and attendees in the chat drop down so that your message can be seen by everyone. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Marty Linsky, class of 1961, and Camille Preston, class of 1993. And cheers to all you 61s and 93s who joined us today. A poli sci major at Williams, Marty recently retired after nearly 40 years of teaching at the Harvard Kennedy School. In 2002, he co-founded Cambridge Leadership Associates, a leadership consulting practice, which he sold to his staff in 2013. A Harvard Law graduate, he's been assistant minority leader of the Massachusetts House, writer for the Boston Globe, editor of The Real Paper, and chief secretary to former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld. Marty has co-authored or authored more than a dozen books and chapters, including the best-selling Leadership on the Line. Camille double majored in art and psych and is the founder and CEO of AIM Leadership. A psychologist by training and experienced leadership coach, Camille's past and present clients include Fortune 500 companies, government and military organizations, not-for-profits, and individuals seeking to optimize their performance. A recognized thought leader on virtual effectiveness, Camille is also a sought after speaker and the author of two books, Rewired and Create More Flow. After Williams, she earned a PhD in psychology from UVA and advanced training in leadership from Georgetown. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Camille and Marty. Fantastic. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, Marty. You're still on mute. Oh, now I'm on mute. How, how are you doing? I'm well. I'm so excited for our conversation today. And I'm so excited to hear from our colleagues and peers at Williams to hear what's been on their mind. Uh, Camille, so you've been working with clients for the last 15 months through all of this. Uh, what have you learned? What have you observed? What, what are the challenges still ahead? Oh, um, that's a that's a big it's a full question. Um, the past fifteen months have been such a several several questions. Just pick the one you want. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the the past fifteen months have been such a uh, roller coaster emotional ride as it relates to leadership, and um, I think on the sunny side, it has been an exceptional time to see people who've invested in their own growth and their development really get to kind of test their capacity to lead. There's been so many bumps and unexpected twists and turns. And I've, I've witnessed some leaders just open up to the challenge and just accelerate, driving massive change, stepping into this next level of leadership. And others have really um, struggled. Um, but, but I think it's, I think overall we're coming out into this new workplace stronger and better with a lens for what needs to happen going forward. I'm curious your perspective. Well, I, I think the, the big picture challenge for people now is to think about um, what of all the adaptations they've made in the last 15 months that have been forced on them, whether they saw it as a, you know, an opportunity or as a problem. Um, what of all those adaptations are worth bringing forward? and what are uh, worth giving a decent berry to and leaving behind. Um, you know, it seems to me that as explicit and intentional as we can be about that, the more likely it is that the learnings from the last 15 months will help us going forward. You know, 
you just think about what you just said, this, the idea of your capacity to adapt, your capacity to deal with uncertainty, um, those skills, which are not skills that people are necessarily trained for, um, but people had to learn how to adapt and how to learn how to deal with uncertainty over and over again in my conversations with CEOs and senior executives in organizations, um, they talked about the pressure on them to, to be clear when they themselves are completely unclear. And handling that tension, holding that tension, dealing with uncertainty and the uncertainty of people around you seems to me to be a wonderful lesson if we can bring it forward. Yeah. Um, Marty and I are going to continue this thread, but please, we would love to have people put in the chat. What are things that you have adapted to or taken on in the pandemic that you hope you don't return to? So we want, we want to hear those. Um, I think there's one massive trend that you alluded to, Marty, that I'm seeing is, is a shift away from productivity and efficiency and kind of execute at all costs into a, a new trend towards resilience and agility. I mean, the, the spring was a list, um, a learning journey of just, you know, adapting and then whack-a-mole kind of having yeah. to shift gears. And as you said, the, the levels of uncertainty and the levels of complexity. Um, I had one client who has a couple different companies. He has a um, private equity firm, a national um, retail brand and a cannabis company. And the equations that he was running for each of the different business lines, he said, I'm doing, I'm running equations with two to three unfixed variables for each business. So there were so many different permutations. And then there was so much difference across the, the business lines. We, I mean, we saw some companies explode and we saw some companies crumble and we saw other people adapt and other people stick to their guns about what they were doing. And it, it really it really opened up a new lens of perspective. I think going forward, agility and resilience are gonna be two of the things that I hope become a leadership premium going forward. That suggests to me something else that I've observed in listening to the stories of people. This is really in your wheelhouse, not in mine, Camille, but <clears throat> this experience, even in the most professional business context, was as much a below the neck experience as it was above the neck experience. And what I'm finding is in my conversations with uh, senior executives is that they are having, having to become better at dealing with people, uh, dealing with people's emotional states than they ever have been before. Again, not something they were trained for, not something they think of as in their competence, their wheelhouse, but something was required in the moment. Um, you know, the, the irony, one of the ironies of the last 15 months is that um, we only had a shared experience at a, at a very high level of abstraction. That this is really, each of us has been on a different journey. It, you know, it depends on what, what stage of your career you are. It depends on whether you have kids at home or not. It depends whether you're, you have a spouse that's working or don't have a spouse. All those factors make each of our journeys distinctive. And what I have seen in the, in the senior executives who have done best under these circumstances is that they've shifted their um, uh, dealing with their peers and subordinates uh, to a, uh, an approach that is much below the neck and above the neck. For example, let me give you a very banal, concrete example. Meetings now start with, how are you doing? You know, what's going on in your life? How's your family? In a way that would have been a waste of time beforehand. But getting a reading on where people are is, is a more uh, central element of management now in senior authority roles than I think it's ever been before. And it'll be interesting to see how much that carries forward or we go back into a more formal, more above the neck mode of operating. Oh, there's so much to react to there, Marty, because I think you hit so many key trends. Um, I think the fact that we're all going through it, and yet it is so different, is, is so spot on. I'm, a, um, I'm an older mom, and, and so a lot of my peers, you know, their kids are going to college. I, <laughs> my kids are in kindergarten, and it's a very different, the, the challenges are so different across, across 
geographies and age groups and life stages. Um, and I, I think it, it also can make it the, there's the isolation from quarantine, but then there's the isolation from having these very different life experiences that makes those check-ins you talk about so unbelievably important. Um, statistically, we're seeing this, um, this trend where so much of the separation between personal and professional life and people are really about keeping those worlds separate have blurred so much, especially in the 20 something generation where so much of their social network was in the workplace. It has become even more so as they are remote and looking to the workplace for social connections. Um, I, I also think there's parts of this like space of quarantine that we've really relaxed into and re gotten comfortable with. And so I'm seeing this uptick of stress and anxiety as people start to return to think about, wait a minute, I'm not ready to give up that, or I'm nervous about seeing all these people, or I'm nervous about managing expectations, and I'm nervous about that re-entry, um, which, which all give us kind of cues or triggers to do some of, more of that internal work to handle complexity, to get clear what matters. What, what is your view on what people should aspire to going forward about the separation between personal life and professional life. I mean, I grew up in a, in a generation where it was quite separate. You know, it was not typical that you would work at home. It was not typical that you would work at night. It was not typical that you would be accessible or access other people 24 seven. Uh, we've gotten used to that. And in some ways it's been glorious, you know, I'm, I'm eating, uh, uh, three meals a day with my wife for the first time in our 40 plus year marriage. You know, it's glorious, but it's different. And, and I'm, I'm trying to think about it from a, you know, best practices point of view, you know, putting on your, your expert guru hat. What do you tell people? How do you advise people about how to manage this going forward? Oh, it's such an interesting question, Marty. Um, I will, I will share personally that I really love the slivers and snippets into seeing people's personal life. It's kind of like going to someone's office and you see the things in their, their background and you have a little sense of who they are. Um, well, or at least who they want to be understood as. Well, I would say yes and for, for people on the call, my mom actually popped into the presenter uh, or pre pre-presentation pre mode. So everybody got to meet my mom and then my husband came up for some tech support. And so there's kind of this integration of our personal lives, which is which is actually kind of neat. I think I'm a very um, wear my heart on the sleeve person. The challenge is, so I will say, um, I will contrast that to doing work with a global um, tech company where the practice was to always put the company logo fake screen behind you. And I found it really hard to start conversations where I didn't even know what geography people were in. I couldn't even tell from the light. And I, I had no cues or clues to who that person was to start to engage in a conversation. So I personally like that personal side. The challenge I think is gonna be so hard for so many stakeholders is um, we're moving away from work-life balance and into work-life integration. And that really hinges on emotional intelligence self-awareness, what do I need? What is the right balance for me? And then the self-regulation, the discipline to put things in place. I personally do my best work at four in the morning. I'm a morning person, you can hate me, <laughs> that's who I am. But I also unplug now to get my kids off of Zoom school at, at 3.30 or four. So we're all figuring out our own balance. The problem is workplaces have to make sure that everybody in the workplace has the ability to create a voice and be able to create those boundaries to find a balanced integration that works for them. And I think that's where there's going to be tension. I'm curious. Your two, two questions occur to me. One is, uh, are, are there kind of best practices about work-life integration or work, work, work life integration, or is it let a thousand flowers bloom? We're going to invent it in different ways all the time. Um, and I guess the second question is related to that is when you think about it from a senior executive point of view, um, do you try to reduce the number of rules that are rules for everybody and try to 
customize your relationships and your rules for individuals depending on their situations. I mean, the rules for someone who doesn't have kids should be different from the rules for someone who does, you'd think. Um, I, I'm interested, I'm really curious about what, what advice you give people going forward on both those questions. Well, I, um, I'll, I'm gonna take the second one and then I'm gonna pump, pump, pump the first one back to you on the um, best practices, because I think it's a work in progress. Sure. Um, I think in terms of the workplaces, I'm trying to remember which client it was, but um, it was a pharmaceutical company. And the executive said, we can't legislate policies quickly enough to respond to the way things are changing. And I thought, well, that strikes me as a problem with your culture, because if you need to legislate policies, that's like, as opposed to setting outcomes and expectations and, and a culture of values. And I think the, um, I'm gonna see if I can shift to a slide because I think there's a really interesting trend that we're seeing as it relates to change management that is a ripple from um, the pandemic. I'm just gonna share this screen. And in, if you think about the pandemic, what happened was just an unprecedented amount of top-down change. We shut down, we went remote, we furloughed people, we laid people off, we re-employed people. We, we went through so much change in 2020, but most of it was top-down. And, and so some people would say, we're really good with change. And I would push back and say, the change that's coming in the workplace is not gonna be top-down for most workplaces or for the kind of the front edge more innovative tech entrepreneurial change initiatives. And what we're seeing is this idea, and this is research that comes from Gartner, that when organizations can create a culture where they hear everybody's voices and everybody's voices is heard in a way that we create open source change rather than top-down change, it has a huge uptick in terms of the quality of the workplace. And so I think for organizations trying to figure it out, it's how do you sit in the uncertainty? How do you, how do you be comfortable? Kind of make it bad, make it better. How do you get clear on the outcome and flexible on the approach to try things? But but I'm curious. You have more experience in this. Well, what would what would be your prediction? Here, here's the tension. I mean, the tension that I kept hearing over and over again is that um, from senior executives is, is their employees wanted them to be clear and decisive. Uh, at a time in which they were unclear and were feeling very indecisive. And my experience, interesting, is that the ones who stepped up to that challenge and became clear and decisive didn't do as well as the ones who said, hey, the world has changed. You know, I don't know what the hell is, ha what is gonna happen. I don't know, and we're gonna invent this together. And they began to do what you call open source management as, as a response to the crisis as opposed to defaulting to the pressure on them to be the authoritarian uh, guru uh, and tell everybody what to do. And people would say to me, people want me to tell them what to do. And my pushback is that's the challenge. The challenge is to push back on them and say, no, we've got to invent this together because I had never been here before. Nobody ever told me how to operate under these circumstances. There is no rule book. I can't pull something off my shelf and tell you what the 10 steps are. We're gonna invent this. And the organizations that have thrived, at least the ones that I've worked with, are the ones that have uh, adapted to, that, to the crisis in that way, rather than defaulting to be more decisive when they didn't know what the hell they were doing. So true. I, I'm, um, I have purple and gold blood running through my body and I've so enjoyed getting to know Marty in this and I tapped on ETHs around the, I'm very blessed by my e friendships. I think this is a perfect reason to have a liberal arts education. I think a liberal arts education is about learning how to think and how to problem solve rather than knowing knowledge. And so in some ways, that adaptive leadership that you've been so, you've been such a thought leader in is why is part of kind of being comfortable with the uncertainty, being curious and exploring and um, Wendy, I'm just giving you a little, a little shout out because <laughs> I think Williams has done a good job preparing us. I want to check in with you, Wendy. Are there questions that you want us to respond to or Marty and I can continue kind of exploring some stuff around wellness and burnout? 
So no official questions in the Q&A queue, but um, amazing observations in the comments in responding to your, to your prompts. Um, so, but there were a few comments that kind of have questions embedded in them. So I think I'll put those forward. Uh, let's see. Um, Melissa asks, how can leaders build resilience and ability? What are the most important elements yeah, yeah, I think this connects very closely to what Camille was just talking about, about what she calls open source management. That is, one of the ways you develop resilience in yourself and in your team is by not, no, not pretending that you know what you don't know and not being forced into a place where you are um, responding to the need for to people to be, to have clarity when there is no clarity. Um, and if you sit around with people around the table, and, and I have encouraged I've, throughout uh, uh, the work that I've done over years, but particularly in this period of time, when you're having um, a senior meeting, uh, one of the ways to build resilience on your team, if it's your team, if you're the senior authority team, is to don't speak at all during the meeting. Um, and when I ask, uh, one of the things I, I try to challenge CEOs to do is to have a senior team meeting where they not only don't speak, but don't run the meeting, don't set the agenda, and don't sit at the head of the table. Now, it's a metaphorical table these days, but it will again be a table in some cases. Um, and my experience is that CEOs find that absolutely excruciating, and they find it to be a source of the best meetings they've ever had. Um, and this idea of the, the, the way you build resilience, both in yourself and your team, is by creating that sense of uncertainty is just another condition. You know, it's not something to panic about, and it's not something to default to uh, pretending we know what we don't know. Uh, I, I use the, the, uh, the, the tension between um, creating the future and predicting the future, and try to, to encourage people to think of themselves as not trying to predict what's going to happen, but trying to create a future that they want. That's brilliant. Great, so there have um, now Wendy, been a few I, more comments. Um, can oh, can just, I just you... add a quick thing to the, the, sure. the component? Because I think what Marty's talked about is at, as, as an organization and creating space is so important. I also think if you bring it down to an individual level, it's also really important. And, and this is starting to tap inward to ourselves and, you know, Marty, Marty and I've had a couple of conversations about this, but so often the workplace focuses on our head and our ability to connect and think. And this muscle gets so small that we lose the ability to connect into our heart of like, what am I feeling and what is that telling me? And then the intuition and wisdom of the body. And that there's a little out there, but so much of the pandemic has created space for people to tap inward and to really connect with themselves. And um, we have had outside of COVID, perhaps one of the healthiest years as a nation because of masks, better eating habits, because of our fear around COVID, we tend to have been living healthier ways, connecting into our body. That cultivates resilience. I think it's so important. And I think as we go back out into the world, we wanna go inward and kind of have more clarification of what have I learned about myself? What do I need? What sets me up for you to be my, my best self? And then how do I start to have conversations out in the world? And one of my absolute, I'll, I'll share two of my favorite things from, um, from, from COVID. One is from a dear friend um, who taught me about COVID lemonade in, uh, in probably it was April. And she said, I'm just making COVID lemonade right, left and center. I was like, excuse me? She said, every day I look for something that I've experienced, done or felt that I wouldn't have felt were it not for the pandemic. And, and then she said, you love margaritas, so this should work out well for you. And <laughs> it's a really good mindset to start to look for that. The second question is asking people around you that you are in relationship, what's become clear to you? What have you learned about yourself in COVID? Starts to open up a really rich, genuine conversation that kind of clears away the, the chatter and, and dives into that vulnerable, authentic connection that Marty was speaking so powerfully to earlier. It's because it, it's exactly parallel to the organizational challenge. And it's also about a family, family challenge, family practices, you know, 
uh, the, the same question for an organization, for a family, for an individual. Uh, what of all the things you've done in the last 15 months would you like to keep going? And what are the things that you'd like to give a decent burial to and never, and never have to experience again? Uh, and to be intentional about that, I think being intentional is very central to this. I mean, being intentional to the point of making a list, you know, what, what have we done differently as a family that we'd like to keep going? Uh, we, we have, there are nine cousins in my, my generation on my, on my mother's side, um, uh, nine of us still alive. We have a huge 25 year age range um, and we don't know each other very well. We grew up in two or three different places. We don't know each other very well. We've started these, these Zoom conversations and they've been sometimes awkward, sometimes lovely. One, we were 10 and one of us died during COVID. Um, but it's not clear to me that there is the energy to keep them going. I mean, it's really interesting. We're now at this point where we're kind of talking to each other about whether we're gonna keep it going. It was, a, it was important to do during this period. Um, and people have to say, well, this is important, not just during this period, but this is important to me. Um, it's something I want to keep in my life. And I think there is a, you know, even in, for, for my wife and I, who have been seriously inconvenienced and full of survivor guilt, mostly during COVID, we have the same questions about what, what, what of all the things that we've done differently, should we try to keep going? And, you know, what are this COVID related and let's pretend they never happened. Marty, I want to take a quick moment because I, I just looked at the chat and I, I, um, I think you and I are doing a great job at lemonade making um, and you're in a beautiful location probably that's going to have some fruity drinks at some point in your day. Um, but I, I want to acknowledge Kathy's comment because it is really true. We have a ton of people where COVID has not been filled with lemons that were or the bandwidth to make lemonade and um, I think we are all unbelievably grateful for the hard work of um, all the frontline workers, all the healthcare workers, and you know the complexity. I I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to put your life on the line in the pandemic response, and then see people out drinking in a bar and partying. And so, like, I, we're we're having a kind of a split conversation. I think your point is really spot on. Like, Kathy, I want to just go one step further because I think. One of the trends I'm really nervous about coming into coming out of the pandemic is burnout. And what we've known about burnout is an occupational stress. But for many people, burnout is like stress at home, stress in their life, stress in their marriage, stress in their workplace, stress in their finances. It's it's all encompassing. And I I think there's going to be this new entry. And I'm curious, Marty, what what words of wisdom would you have for people as we come back with that burnout? Well, I, I think, again, it goes back to what we were saying before, which is that everybody has been on a different journey. Um, you know, my Survivor's Guild is about living in New York City during March and April last year when it felt like a war zone, um, nonstop ambulances and all of that stuff. And when I would go for a walk in the park, I would see the tents from the overflow of the hospitals. Um, you know, I, I, I gave away more money last year than I ever have before. I, but it was, but it was, you know, feeling that, that my experience was not representative or was not connected to those people for whom this was an existential crisis. And um, millions of people are in that way. So that it goes back to me to, to what we were saying at the beginning, which is understanding the journey that people have been on for 15, the last 15 months and knowing that it is different for everyone. And for some people, it has been uh, uh, a period of characterized mostly by loss, as opposed to some people it's been characterized by inconvenience. Um, and everybody sits along that spectrum somewhere. Uh, we, we, know how to, we know how to help people go through periods of grief. We've all experienced that on both ends. Um, but it is that customization, I think, that is so key, is that trying to find out from people who you work with, people who you rely on, people who are relying on you, what their experience has been and what their needs are, so you can um, meet them where they are rather than where you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Marty, I'm just going to pull up a couple 
themes that I heard is agility, just like in the workplace, just like in the boardroom. Um, and, you know, I think of grief, it popped into my mind. Um, two of my classmates uh, lost parents, three of my classmates, actually, now that I'm counting, five classmates that are in my inner circle have lost parents or step parents in, the, in a period of time. And we've been really creative having kind of virtual memorial services, not the, not the memorial service of their yes. family, but the, their people coming together and saying like, how are you? Like having memories and conversations. Yeah. So that's another example of agility, but grieving has been so different in, at a distance that it's, it's another evolution. And I think all of this is like this, um, I'm like taken back to LaSalle gym and thinking about agility training before <laughs> preseason for lacrosse, but this is a lot of agility training we're, we're doing and kind of opening to that, I think is really powerful. Um, in your work, Marty, you've talked about um, getting on the balcony, adaptive leadership and getting perspective. And I'm a huge believer of the more you can get altitude for some of these challenges, the more you can be strategic in your response. And I think that's one of the things that as we think of this kind of re-entry is gets people a little nervous. It's like, how do I still get that, that altitude, that perspective? And so I'm, I'm curious if you want to lead us forward into thinking about kind of the return to work and what that might mean as we consider hybrid. Well, I think a lot depends on what your practice has been during this period of time. It's worked for you. Um, and if you have, as some of my friends have, been able to read books and to reflect and take long walks, and um, then what are those practices can you bring forward if they work for you? That, that, that's why I go back, Wendy, uh, Camille, to thinking about how important it is to be intentional. That is to make a list, to re reflect on this experience, right? um, and not to... Um, uh, not to, to, to put it behind you, but to use it as a, an opportunity to learn, as you said at the beginning, about yourself and about the context in which you work. There, there's one big point, which I think um, you were dancing toward, which is that uh, it's, it's a period of time in which I think people have learned to take responsibility for themselves, taking care of themselves, um, and that seems to me to be very central to what we're talking about, that taking care of yourself is not self-indulgent. It's not irresponsible. Um, it's your obligation to you, not only to yourself, but to your family and to your team. If you don't take care of yourself in all the normal ways, um, then you're not bringing your A-game. And part of taking yourself care of yourself, I think, is finding a way to stand back on a, a, a regular basis and ask yourself, what's going on here? What am I experiencing? What am I feeling? What, I, what do I see happening? Um, uh, what, what's my adaptation to the current reality? I'm just, I'm left, I, I, I could not agree more, Marty. And I'm left thinking also just a yes and to that is managers creating space for people on your team, asking yes. that question, what have you learned? What do you need to make this an ideal workplace? How can we co-create, again, that open source, what that looks like going forward? And I think it's it's both critical, but it's also a really hard question to, to say, what is it I need? You know, we're so focused out on serving others, but it's that oxygen mask of putting ourselves in. Um, there's one more nugget. Wendy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna float an idea to you so you can respond to this at the end, but It'd be kind of interesting if there was a place where we could have alumni share in a paragraph or two, you know, what they've taken on during COVID that has been really powerful and what insights they think about taking forward. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the case model of leadership, which is copy and steal everything, because I'm sure there's brilliance that other people have adapted that would be really interesting to kind of incubate. Um, with that, Wendy, do you have, want to just check in with you? I see some questions there and I want to make sure we're responsive. Yeah, no, that's great. Do you want to, um, are there questions you want to focus us towards or should we continue into the hybrid workplace? Oops. I think you're on mute, Wendy. Sorry, needed to unmute. 
Um, so Jeff Henderson has, uh, Class 97 has reposted from the chat, and, and this question really deals with the um, transition to post-COVID time. So I'm going to put it up there. She said, my organization, Craft School at Makerspace, has pivoted to offering successful online content this last year, which has been awesome. One challenge we're facing as we reopen is how to bring back all the volunteers we depend on to run that who have trickled away over the past 12 months. Our capacity to do both online and in person is gonna stretch our small staff. Any ideas, I think, how to re-engage um, and how to adapt and change going forward. Certainly it's my sense that uh, the way people stepped up uh, on a volunteer basis, uh, on a contribution basis, um, uh, is, is there's going to be a lot of fall off from that. You, you cannot expect, it's like an alumni reunion. You know, you don't expect everybody to come back. Um, and, and that doesn't mean they're bad people or they're disloyal. It just means it's not that important in their lives and that's okay. Uh, I think the same thing is true here. And I, I'm on the board of a couple of nonprofits and we're dealing with some of those similar kinds of issues. And so we, we created tremendous energy in a lot of ways during the last 15 months. And we're not gonna be able to maintain that because people are gonna go back to their lives. So I think it's a question, it's another kind of adaptation, you know, of all the energy that was generated and all the output that you created from that energy what is the most important for you to keep going and what is gonna be COVID one time and you know it's too bad, but we can't do everything all the time. Uh, I think those are hard questions, but I think they're really important questions that, because they tell you what you value the most uh, as hard as, as it is to let things go that have worked for you. I would also just add like taking, mic taking stock in micro moments, like checking in on a regular basis rather than making a gestalt decision yeah. looking backwards. Um, I'll share a quick nugget. We got, um, I'm based in Cambridge and we bought the book 50 Hikes in Eastern Mass. And we've done five hikes in the two weekends. My kids are totally into it. It's phenomenal. Um, on Sunday, we did a bunch of great hikes, but we stopped and dropped pansies for a distant cousin of mine who took care of a very dear uncle of mine when he had cancer. And then uh, an uncle of my husband's who had Huntington's at the end of the day, we said, what was the best part of the day? And we had so much fun. It topped on top with ice cream at the end. And everybody said it was the pansy delivery. And it was this moment of like, oh, got to ask those questions to make sure we're checking in. Because that was that was a, a last minute ad. And I think that data over time can support us. Um, Again, it's, it's a lot about asking questions. It's a lot about helping people sort out of all those wonderful things that happened in your hike, which was the most important and which you wanna make sure you keep in your practice somehow um, and, and, and getting where people are. You know, I, I think we've learned a, a big lesson about um, the distinctiveness and the distinctiveness of our journeys. Yeah, I, I will add one more nugget linking in the question from Tim Sullivan about uh, informal interactions. And I think we saw as we went remote, everybody was like Zoom cocktails and then yeah. like fired up and then the burnout, the stress, the strain kind of hit, people kind of checked out, unplugged. You know, we saw this massive, up let me just step back. So the best way to think about burnout is that we all have emotional bank accounts, mental bank accounts, uh, mental, emotional, physical, and kind of purpose or spiritual. And for the first eight months of COVID, we were making micro withdrawals from these emotional bank accounts because we were no longer able to go out to drinks with friends or to that hot yoga class. And come October, many of us felt overdrawn. And we were starting to look, especially in New England, ahead to a complicated political season, dark winters, and then holidays in new ways that we've never had, and then surging numbers. We had all of that complexity. So the burnout stacked and stacked and stacked. What I'm seeing in companies now that are really thriving is they've brought back informal communal gatherings, but have really harnessed it around learning. And so we've been bringing in some, some kind of learning stimulus that is like the structure for the things that, what Marty's been talking about, what we've been talking about of how do you build resilience? How do you understand burnout? 
you have these conversations that has then inspired the, the questions. And I think to your question, Tim, I think people are sick of Zoom cocktails with people like at the Zoom place that they've always, they sat their whole day. So try bringing in some learning, some new questions, some fresh perspectives. And one thing we played with is like, you can't sit at your Zoom background. Like this is my office Zoom background. I couldn't come to a social in the Zoom background, but so starting to kind of like stir it up, but put some structure and some intention and some new tools opens a really purposeful, rich conversation potentially. Camille, can I ask you a, a, a question which might be um, a uh, too loaded, but um, I was thinking as you were talking about what's going to be the fallout or the consequence of having uh, having us having dealt with a, uh, the the uh, racial crisis at the same time as we dealt with the COVID crisis uh, and all the activity around DEI work. How do you think that's going to play out in the post-COVID world or what should people be thinking about how that what are the consequences of our dealing with what I think of as multiple pandemics at the same time? Oh, it is such a good question and such an important because we have the COVID pandemic, we have the racial justice, we have the mental health pandemic. Um, and, and a governance pandemic. <laughs> and, a, and a real, yeah, just massive complexity there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have answers, but I, I will say, doing your own work, which is a constant theme of this, that we have a responsibility to show up and do our work to learn and educate and take care of ourselves. I feel like it's kind of the, the privilege of having gone to a Williams is to, to take that forward, to continue the learning. Um, and, and I think my hope is that we sustain the open heart and that curiosity to learn because I, I will share that I am on such a learning journey and it, it, it feels like I'm dipping my toe into the ocean. Perhaps you have a, maybe you can share what your wisdom will share with us. Well, about them. No, it's, it's, it's quite similar. I mean, I think that this idea that uh, you have a, uh, a responsibility to yourself and to whatever it is you care about and whoever it is you care about to continue to learn yourself. You know, and to not think that you, um, self-righteous people drive me crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, my most powerful experience at Williams was with uh, Professor Robert Fabino, who, um, who, whose mantra is about uncomfortable learning and about putting yourself in situations where you are uncomfortable, where you don't know what the right answer is, um, and learning by confronting those situations and getting through them. Um, and I think that's similarly true with, um, uh, with how we're dealing with the diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives. Um, there's, there's a lot of experimentation going on. There's a lot of confusion, I think. Um, and there's a lot of good and bad news. Uh, and seeing yourself, even in my dotage as I am, seeing yourself as part of that journey, as part of that process, and not thinking that you uh, have uh, uh, more to teach than to learn, uh, yeah. that your age hasn't, that the wisdom of your age is about continuing the curiosity rather than um, sharing what you think you've learned. Yeah. Uh, all of that yeah. seems central to me. All of that seems so central. And also just to circle us back to where you started, which is we don't know the answer. We don't know what's going to happen. And staying in that curiosity is really important. Um, there's two questions in the Q&A, one around um, from Mark Johnson around internal communications and one from Carolyn Troy that I'm going to I'm going to put together because I think the future of work is really to be reinvented. I think there's a there's a another force that we haven't mentioned, which is this idea of automation where um, we had all this, Marty, maybe you have the data, but 30% um, of the workforce was going to be made obsolete by 2030 because of automation. And that just, that, that I, don't quote me on that statistic, but that statistic accelerated as a result of the pandemic, which means that 
for everyone on this call who's still in the workforce, you're going to need to learn 10% of your job skills new every year. We are going to be needing to innovate and iterate and develop our skills and capabilities. So if we can hold that knowledge with the ability to co-create kind of the best workforce, that's going to, that's going to reduce your, it's going to increase retention. It's going to reduce turnover. It's going to increase satisfaction. It's going to reduce burnout. There's a huge uptick if you create a good culture that attracts people. The question about how do you engage different stakeholders and how do you make sure people's voices are heard is more complicated and really is a part of the responsibility of leadership. So Mark, I think there's just a huge problem with not being able to drop in with by someone's office. So we schedule a 30 minute Zoom conversation to answer a 10 minute question that really probably could be answered in five. And then we, we start losing our schedules. So we have to get people's voices back and we have to get to the place where people feel like they can actually articulate what it is that they want in the workplace. So that's um, my mantra is clear in the outcome, flexible in the approach. If leaders are clear on the outcome, the type of work environment they want, they need to create the flexibility to hear the voices and let those come up so that it's a co-created place. Yeah, it sounds a lot like what, what we, one of the themes that we've been talking about is that um, it, it is a, is a responsibility about thinking about, uh, about the big picture, but it is your responsibility to also to work with uh, colleagues to invent how you get from here to there. Um, so the big picture is just a just a, an abstraction, uh, and the real work is the creative process of getting from here to there and realizing that no one has the right answers and no one has the knowledge. There is no textbook. Uh, yeah. And maybe there's not one right answer too. So like right. that that innovation. Well, that, that that raises one other one other idea that I just want to put out there, which is that. I found it useful to work with people to encourage them to think of themselves as in the experiment, experimenting business, not, as, not in the problem solving business, but the experimenting business. When you think of yourself in the experimenting business, then you can, the stakes are lower. You haven't put all your chips on the table. Um, you have an obligation to uh, uh, kill the experiment if it isn't working. And you always learn something. There's no such thing as failure. And it is hard in some organizations to think of yourself as running experiments rather than solving problems because there's so much pressure on you to do that. But I think it's a really useful frame, you know, because we're, we're running an experiment here. We don't know, you know, but here's our assumptions. Here's what we're testing and we're going to learn something, whatever happens. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I would add into that, like, as you're testing these experiments, explore how you can go across silos or across work environments. And I, I think back to Kathy's wonderful comment about healthcare workers. I, I think when you bring in the diversity to some of those experiments and the alternative perspectives, um, kind of like fusion cuisine, like if you put Asian and Mexican cooking together, what would you create? And I think the more we can start to bring those different perspectives, it will also maybe help as we I'd love to have had this whole hour spent on uh, identity and how that plays out in the workplace and how it plays out in the future. I think it's also uh, going to be one of the consequences of this last 15 months is uh, my experience so far is that uh, workplaces, no matter how virtual or how in-person they become, are going to be different because of the um, uh, the commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, and that's gonna create different practices. Um, I've been working with a couple of organizations about um, hiring and succession and issues around uh, um, search committees and those kinds of processes and retooling them to make sure that they are um, open to voices that they wouldn't ordinarily be attracted to. Yeah. I think that's really important. Um, one thing we haven't touched on, Marty, we touched on it briefly at the beginning. Well, we touched on it, I guess, a couple of times, but I think another part of this whole COVID well-being return to the work is really around career management and how that's gonna look so different for people based on where they were 
going into the pandemic where they were coming out. I know a couple of people in the chat mentioned they've onboarded to a new organization and all they know is <laughs> from, the, from the chest up of their colleagues, they don't have a lot of contextual data. Um, and I think it's gonna be different across generations. So I'm curious, um, given your stance, your kind of your sage wisdom, what, what words of wisdom would you have for people, I would say at different stages of their career, but particularly maybe the younger, our younger um, colleagues that are still at the crafting of their career? Well, uh, boy, that's way beyond my wheelhouse, Camille. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to learn from them and understand their experience. Uh, you know, it, 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 it feels so different for me. Um, and um, I, I can't begin to think about it except, except in the sense of saying to my contemporaries uh, and those people not much uh, younger than me, uh, that the, their way of doing business is not the right way, it is their way. And that the values of uh, younger generations that seem to be so challenging are an opportunity for them to learn something and not to try to socialize people into the norms that they've been accustomed to and they've worked for them. I, I really, um, one of the things uh, here talking to uh, uh, Williams alumni is to acknowledge how incredibly privileged we've been um, to have the, the, the head start that Williams gave us. Um, and, and what a difference that has made and that that didn't, you know, we were, we were just lucky to be there. Yeah. Um, I, I see Wendy is, is, um, is sending us some signals. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're close to the hour. Um, I think the, a couple of the nuggets that I would just use to, to coalesce this is there's so much opportunity to co-create where you go where the, where you where we as a society go where you go where your organization goes and the more you have stock internally about what's important and then strategies to kind of open questions open dialogues to have conversations around the agility to have conversations about what's possible but what you need agility altitude perspective curiosity these are all those themes that i think will help us go forward closer, um, let me see it differently. I'm a big believer in make it bad, make it better. But I think with altitude, agility, perspective, curiosity, we will get closer to better quicker. Yes, and, and to, to me, one of the takeaways has is, is been in all the dimensions we've talked about is to try to see uh, problems as opportunities uh, and to think about what you can learn from them. Uh, rather than to find them uh, create stoppage, see them as opportunities. And, and Marty, I'll, I'll just close before passing it to Wendy. It has been such a pleasure and opportunity to connect with you in these conversations. It, again, makes my um, purple and glow, gold blood run hot and uh, excited for the Williams community. So thank you for sharing this. And Wendy, thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you too, Camille. This, is, this has been great. Well, it's been a pleasure for all of us. Um, I want to give a quick shout out um, to Dr. Carlene Carey, who's put some wonderful resources related to DEI questions in the chat. So take a moment and look at those. Um, and, you know, just want to thank all of you for uh, participating today, because truly by being part of this conversation, you're, you're making the network stronger. So um, we have reached the end of our program. You know, Marty and Camille, this has been something that we've been talking about for such a long time. And it's, um, it's so great. I feel like we could all sit and listen to you for the rest of the afternoon, but we're gonna go back to our virtual and in some cases, actual workspaces. Um, attendees, you're gonna be receiving a super quick survey about your experience. And we truly, truly welcome your feedback as well as ideas for future topics. And I'm just gonna put this out there. Maybe there's some of you who are gonna be who are inspired by what Marty and Camille have brought today. And you're thinking that, hey, I could be a Williams at Work webinar presenter. So just to put out, put it out there, I'm um, we're putting the submission form for um, any ideas you have right. you'd like to do right in the chat. Um, and we're also sharing some additional resources from Camille and Marty. So be sure to download those before we call it a day. 
Um, the last thing I'm going to say is we're going to be posting a recording of today's webinar to the Williams YouTube channel, as well as to the virtual EFs and career resources pages on the alumni website. So wherever you find it, please, please, please share it with any EFs you know, and I know you know EFs who'd benefit today's presentation, but who just couldn't make it. So thanks for helping us to amplify this great news. And finally, from all of us who are working for you here in the virtual Purple Valley in this 200th year of our Society of Alumni, have a great rest of the day. See you later. Thanks, Thank you.